All right, myself, Logan Sama, Chucky, we are here with Yizzy, Prince of Grime. Find out all of that stuff you never knew before. Asking him all of them probing questions. Juicy questions, for real. Yes, man. Yes, man. I that's where we should start, actually. All I right. think we should start with the Prince of Grime, because I know it's like, that's a title that you kind of <laughs> literally just grabbed and said, you know what, this is yeah. me, innit? Is so, has someone got something to say about that? Do you know, the, the story of how that came about is actually mad interesting. So I met Prince Harry last year in November. And I put up a little caption on a cheeky thing like, oh, Prince of Harry meets the Prince of Grant, just as a cheeky thing. And then people thought I was being, like, deadly serious, and it started to catch. I started seeing it more online, a little bit here, a little bit there. And then, obviously, where I was dropping songs and whatnot, the song with Dizzy was dropping around that time as well, so it was, like, Pioneer Dizzy and Young Prince, blah, 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 and a lot of blogs. It just started catching on, so I was like, when I actually sat down to deep it and think like what a prince is, like the, the, the person who's meant to take over from whoever's at the top or pushing it now, like the, the empire, the kingdom, whatever you want to call it, it was like, I do believe I'm that person. For my age, for what I'm doing, for everything that's going on, I do believe that I am the person to take the mantle from whoever that person might be, whether it's deemed as skeptic to people or Stormzy or D-Double or whoever, like I, I do believe that I'm the person for that. And then obviously, when Wiley and Stormzy started clashing in January and I came with my freestyle, it was, it was like a no-brainer to kind of call it Prince of Grime. It was like, you know what, if I'm going to run with this and this is what's starting to pop up here and there, I want to solidify it. And then from that first freestyle, with me and my little chicken box and all my chicken and chips, it's just... Because people take them titles very seriously. <laughs> so you must have had some pushback against that, like... Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, there was, there, was, there was other people that said they were Prince of Grime. There was other people that said I wasn't deserving of the title. But I feel like that's with anything. There's, there's always going to be... Um, there's always going to be a pushback when you're trying to emerge with something new and try and, um, trying to own something and, and become the embodiment of it. There's always going to be a pushback from people. But for me, I've always been a person that thinks I want my work to speak for itself. And I do feel like the work that I've done, the people I've linked up with, the songs I've done, the way I've done it, having my own label, blah, 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 I do think that it is a blueprint and a way of not only to how to do things independently, but also how to do things at a young age as well. Because if you, if you look at anyone that's ever come in grime, what they were doing at the ages of 17, 18, 19, 20, and then you compare it to what I've done, the amount of people that have actually done that level is very few. The ones that I can think of off the top of my head would be like Novelist, Dizzy Rascal, Chipmunk, maybe one or two others, but the list is not endless. And if you talk about in the recent generations, other than Novelist, as far as I know, the next generation you jump to as the younger that's done that would be Chip, and Chip's like 26, 20, 27, something like that. That's a big gap. As it is, Nov's like three, four years older than me, and in between Nov and Chip is like flipping seven, eight years, however it is. So where does the deserved thing come from then? Because... That is something that I've heard a few times as well. Like, mm. ah, like, he doesn't deserve to do this. And you hear that sometimes when it comes mm. to certain artists that have come, you know, at a, come from a different generation. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Like, where do you feel like that comes from with you? I, I think it just comes from... I think it's a mixture of things. I think en jealousy and envy always play a part in everyone. Like, we're humans. You see someone else doing well, your natural reaction is you want to be doing as well as them. It's a human thing. Jealousy is, is a human emotion. Acting on jealousy is a separate thing. Just because I'm jealous or I'm envious or I have these feelings towards it doesn't mean you have to act upon it. So jealousy plays a part in it 100%. I think the second part is always that if someone's got their image, an image in their mind of something, it's very hard to get them out of it. So if I say I'm the Prince of Grime, but Joe Bloggs down the road says, no, this person's Prince of Grime, they are so adamant on that, that to change their mind is almost opinion, is a myth. And I'm not trying to change no one's mind. I've made a statement and I said, this is me, I'm the Prince of Grime. You can either accept that or you can disregard that. That's up to you. Either way, this is still me. I still embody it, I still live it, and I'm still going to live it and continue to. And I'm still going to do stuff in order to push that narrative forward because I genuinely believe that that is the case. And I believe that it's not just me telling you, yo, I'm the Prince of Grime. 
Go back and check what I've done. The EPs we've released, the millions of streams we've done, the millions of views we've done on my own channel. I've never released on another channel. Everything has been from the ground upwards. From the age of 16, I started my own label, Living Legends. You can check. Go check all the releases, everything. You will see that I have literally done this from the ground up. Me, close team, my manager. This, I've been my manager four years now. Me and him, literally. And then there's a couple people along the way. From the ground up in grime, in a time where grime is not popular. I started music in 2016, 2017. Grime was popping and, and Storms and a couple people came through probably around those times, but it was like the tail off of it. I literally caught the tail off, which is not the best thing to do. You want to be in there when the genre is popping. So for me to do that, especially in these times when Afro beats and drill and whatnot is the in sound. It's like, it's more than fighting an uphill battle because it's like, I can't get into certain conversations or get through certain doors because they're asking me, you know, we like, we like your grime stuff, but what, you got, you got anything a bit catchier, anything a bit slower? Mm. I'm being told that repeatedly in, in interviews with this label and this major and this person and blah, 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 this publication, but it, it happens so much. But I, I genuinely believe that the actions that I can do at this age for the future generations and future people to come, future lovers of grime, can definitely leave behind a blueprint. The same way I have been able to follow a blueprint of people that have come before and, and done grime and, and been successful and still been able to stand the test of time, whereas other people that have blown in grime have not necessarily stood the test of time. So I've been able to see that blueprint. I want to leave behind. When you, when you look at um, the work, the, the body of work that you've released and you know the numbers that are out there, the platforms that you've set up for yourself, businesses that you've set up for yourself, you know, how do you feel when people try and discredit that? Because it's, it's like arguing against facts. Like, you can have your opinions. I don't think you deserve to be the Prince of Grime. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're a great MC. People are going to have these opinions if they want, because it's yeah. art and it's subjective. But mm -hmm. when you start discrediting achievements, like, how do you process that as an artist? Do you know, I'm... I'm... Me as a person, I'm someone that's... That's, that's grown up quickly in life more than most people my age. Been through stuff, seen stuff that maybe the average person my age shouldn't have or shouldn't have been subjected to. And, but I'm thankful for those. I don't regret that. I'm thankful for those situations because it's made me very thick-skinned. So when it comes to receiving criticism or negativity or maybe just pure hatred from, from certain situations or people or blah, 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 it doesn't faze me like it would necessarily if I hadn't been through that. Now... For me, I've always ran with the, you don't have to like me, but respect what I'm trying to do for this genre. Me trying to put the name out there of grime in certain doors when it's not been there before or not been in a long while, that is not just for my own benefit. Like, I could do that with a flipping Afrobeat song. I could do that with whatever and probably get to that door mm. six months quicker, a year quicker. I'm doing it with grime because I love it. I'm doing it with grime because this is what means the world to me. And I know that the same way me watching F Radio and seeing Getz and seeing P Money and seeing Griminal and seeing Chip and all these people made me feel, I want to leave something behind like that for the next people to come through. Except me, it was looking at them for F Radio. Maybe it's a, it's a 12 year old kid in a school looking at going, oh, you know what? The only way for me to blow is to do drill and Afro beats and put on a mask and put it on press play or link up TV or GRM daily. We know that's not the case. We're living in the 20th century where there's so many different ways of building an avenue for yourself. Information is free. I want to leave that. So when people try to discredit that, it's like... You, you, it's hard to discredit something that's undeniable. Like, if the work is there in front of you, clear to see, mm. how do you discredit facts? I feel like listening to you speak here, and even with the conversations that we've had before, I could see that integrity is a big thing for you, yeah? Mm. And... With that being said, even going to the side of being discredited, do you feel like this is where that industry plant thing comes from? Because <laughs> you know what, like, I always try to, even when I first heard that come up, I'm like, yeah. what, like, okay, why, why do people say that about you? And maybe it's maybe because I, some people look at you and you're like really clean faced and well mannered <laughs> and all of these type of things. And they, you know, do you understand what I'm saying? But where does it come, where do you feel like that comes from? Do you, do you reckon that speaks to the side? of the discrediting of what people try to do with you in your yeah. career? I think there's a couple angles. First of all, I feel like I've figured out why people think I'm an industry plant. 
Which, disclaimer, in case it wasn't apparently obvious, I'm really fucking not. Um, you sure? <laughs> I'm sure. The BBC did not plant me, Baker. Hand on my heart. Because that's what the narrative is, apparently. Apparently, I was planted by the BBC. Um, I think the whole industry plant thing comes from ignorance. And ignorance comes from lack of information. The way my career has gone in two, three years and the rate at which it's been propelled forward, a lot of people aren't able to explain it. And when you're not able to explain something, a lot of the time, the unknown is quite... To some people, it can be unnerving. And, and it's like question marks. And people don't like the unknown. They want to know at all times what's going on. But what they don't realise is if you actually did your research on me and Googled me, you'd probably find out, oh, 2016, this publication, this happened. 2017, this happened. 2018, he linked up with this person and, and dropped this project or blah, blah. It's there in plain black and white. But people would rather go with the whole, what, how did he do that? Nah, must be an industry plant. It's ignorance. Now, I don't fault ignorance if someone has genuinely tried to get the knowledge on something. But for people that are just blatantly ignorant, as in they don't want to take the time to understand and would rather go with the easy option, I think that's absolute rubbish. Um, but it's, it's very... The, 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 the career I've had in the time I've had it, it's very easy to... like. I started doing open mics, then I started doing uh, pirate radio, I started going mode FM, I started going radar radio, I started going to these different places, getting known as an MC. I wasn't even putting out music these times. Then I, I, um, I linked up uh, BBC Introducing um, and PRS came with a grant that let me perform at Brixton Academy. From then I was able to secure funding, which helped me put out my first project. These are all things that are very easy to do. And then when it's like, oh, but how did you get grant or how did you get the opportunity? You must be a plant brother. You do realise you can apply for how many of these grants, but people are, I'm sorry, people are thick. Rather than them doing their knowledge about how to get fu uh, funding or in certain situations or, or even like, like Glastonbury, like the Emerging Talent Competition, oh, did you get Glastonbury, you shouldn't, blah, 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 how did you, must be fixed. Brother, you can go and apply for it like everyone else, you know. I was blessed to be in that situation and I made the most of it and it had a knock-on effect for opportunities afterwards. Everything that I've done in my career is, is pretty much public information if you look for it. But people would rather just feign... Uh, people, people would rather be ignorant to the situation. I think there's a problem with a lot of people just not believing that if they try it, it will work out for them. And they build up this subconscious idea that, you know, like there's no way for a normal person to access these things. And this isn't just in music, I think this is in general. So people start building these conspiracy theories in their head rather than mm. going through the, the arduous task of, all right, how do I get the PRS grant? I've got to fill in this paperwork. I've got to do this together. I've got to put this proposal. Oh, that's all long, bruv. Like, and then, then they're going to just reject me anyway. All right, cool, I won't bother. But that permeates, especially through the, the music industry, because there's like, there's so much information out there, it's almost like overload yeah. for artists. And as you said, there's a lot of young artists say that haven't had the guidance and you've got a good team around you, mm. help. Yeah. And I think you've got like a unique mindset as well for that in terms of just understanding how things work. Do you know, the, the, the thing that spurred it all for me, if I'm honest, like the, the willingness to go and find out these things and information and find out how to do these things, is probably when I first linked up with my manager. I didn't know anything about management, I didn't know anything about PR, I knew nothing about nothing. And then I, I, I think it was sorting out the first contract or something for a release, and I was like, what's that? Oh, well, you, you need a contract to release stuff, and you need to do the proper way and block. But, but why? I knew nothing about it, and I hated that I was saying I wanted to do a career that I knew nothing about, the bit legal side. So what that did was spur me on to go learn about it. Then I'd come back with another thing, and you'd be like, oh, OK, you, what, what people usually do in this situation is they have PR, and this is how it's pushed, and this is... What's PR? Go away and learn it. Anything I didn't know that came up, I would go away and learn. In the same way that, like, my learning of, of grand knowledge was through YouTube and certain things, but when I was going to radio, maybe this group of people were talking about this grand MC that I had never heard of, because it was old school. I'd go home and I'd look at him. I'd, 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 I'd research it, I'd learn about it. But not everybody's got the same level of get up and go in them. Some people want stuff to come to them easy, and a lot of people just don't care, or, or they, they're happy with it, they get comfortable. Me, I'm never comfortable. I don't live in the present. I'm someone that's always living in the future. I always want to do better. I'm a perfectionist. There are plenty of times where I could be... One, one thing I'm, I've never said out loud, at the peak of my career, every moment, every time I felt like I have at the 
been at the biggest point of my career, whether it was releasing an EP, a song, a video, whatever. Every time I do something and I get to a point where I feel like nothing could be better, I get hit with a wave of depression that lasts for about three, four days solid. I start thinking to myself, well, this is it. How do I do better than this? I can't. Every single time without fail. It happened around Thierry Henry. It happened around SOS EP. It happened around Welcome to Grand Street. It repeatedly happens. Right. And it's, it's one of those feelings where I deal with it myself because I, I know me better than anyone else. Right. But you won't even know. You'll just see me not post for two, three days, come back, and I'll be like, yeah, on to the next. You won't notice. No one, I've never said it out loud. No one knows about this at all. That is just how I deal with stuff. And part of that even, that's when you said about being fixed. I'm, I'm fixed skinned, but I'm still human. I can still read or see stuff online and it can still be like, it's, 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 still, it's still damaging. Like the, regardless of what anyone tells you, if they're the biggest artist in the world, whether it's Jay-Z, flipping Storm, Ed Sheeran, whoever it is, we are all still human. We will still see certain things and it will still trigger something and affect us. We're, it's natural, we're human. Mm -hmm. But you've got to overcome that and not let it get the best of you. And the only kind of good point I see from, from me getting depressed a lot of the time after these highs is that I use that to go, now nah, pattern up, like, sort yourself out. Like, you're at the best position possible right now and you're getting sad and depressed and blah, blah, blah. And usually that leads on to me doing the next big thing. Right. So I use that as a driver. For me, it's either make or break and I refuse to be broken. From the moment I quit my nine to five job earning good money, went home and looked my mum in the face and said, yeah, I'm doing music now. There was no going back. I will not be beaten. I will not be taken down by criticism. I will not be taken down by hatred. I do not have a choice. This is me. From, from the age of 17, when I quit my job, I didn't go to college. I didn't do none of that. I, I started the job straight away. I needed money to fund my music. Yeah. There is no going back. Of course. You know what? Like I find these parts of the conversation, for me personally, really interesting because I feel like it's very easy to talk about success. Mm. Um, I think it's very easy to talk about, you know, you've had deep, this much views on this or you've started this and done all of that and stuff like that. And it's good and it's inspiring. But I feel like for a lot of artists, there are a lot of artists and a lot of people in general that are going through, you know, a lot of really deep things. Mm. And like, for you, I kind of wanted to ask you, do you, like, where, do you know where the, the, the root cause of you starting to feel this type of way in your career came from? Um, the root cause... Uh, I, I don't... In, in terms of the, the, like, getting depressed and how I feel about... So I, I don't know if I can pin it down to, like, one reason. I think it's more just a build-up of, of stuff like I don't talk openly about a lot of my other than like a select few of my close friends and family I don't really talk about my stuff a lot I'm very and it's a very toxic trait I'm very much a person that keeps stuff bottled up and just deals with it myself right. even though it's probably not the best thing to do it's definitely not the best thing to do, definitely not the best thing to do. Um, but that's just my way of dealing that's how I've dealt with things growing up from being a kid that's how I've always dealt with things like there, there is I've always been my own emotional outlet, which is mad to say because it's like the whole point of an emotional outlet is that it's an outlet, it's not you, it's something or someone else. Um, but where I've just been doing that for so long over the years, it's just like I've just learned to deal with that, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say there's a root cause. I think it's just a build-up of going through certain things over the years. So, I mean, you, you say that this normally occurs you know, after the the creative highs of completing a project and then you, have, you kind of... Is this something that you had, like, in your younger years as well? Because you come from, like, a really big family, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. having to find your own time to, to process and deal with things, obviously, like, your mum and, and all your siblings, there's not the bandwidth there to be able to rely on, you know, getting yeah. the, the, the focus, so you are kind of left to your own devices, to, to, to build your own coping mechanisms with the highs and the lows uh, in life? Yeah, I'd, I'd say it, it probably happened. In fact, no, it did happen. And uh, one of my friends can vouch for this as well. So before I was even doing music, I was doing running. I was never meant to be a rapper. I was, plan I was doing athletics. I was running for London. I was doing 100 meters. I was training five times a week. This is what I was doing. I had plans to go to America on a track and field scholarship. That was my life. 
there are plenty of times I would run the 100 metres for my borough, Lewisham, do really well, beat a lot of people, and then I'd go to the big competitions like London, the whole of England now, and I'd get whooped, like made to feel like so insignificant. I thought, oh, yeah, I'm the best in my end, I'm the best in my borough, but mm. you see, when I open up the whole of England now, I'm, I don't even get into that conversation. <laughs> That's a, that used to hit so hard, and it used to ground me a lot. And I, I will never forget the feeling of being the fastest in my school, going to the competition, losing the competition, coming back, but still being held as the fastest. I'm just thinking to myself, it's really not that. I'm so glad you lot didn't see what, it's really not that. Um, so yeah, it extended even to, to that or, or like, I don't know, even in school, for example, it could be like to do with like uh, uh, certain grades or mock exams or whatnot, everything was going really well. And then, and then something happened and it didn't end up as, as good as I expected. Like that happened a lot for me, especially around my GCSEs. Um, that, that didn't go how it should have. So but it, it's just been like a build up of, of stuff. I'm a big proponent of like failure, letting you know who you are as a human being, you know, like surviving through failure and not quitting uh, and, you know, living through that humbling experience, whatever it might be, yeah. work, passions, love life, anything, you know. Mm. Um, it, it definitely lets you find out who you are. Mm. Uh, and if you've been going through that as a teenager, when a lot of people are still living in that small bubble of, I exist within this school group, this small borough, and you've gone out into the real world and kind of had that humbling experience, lets you approach everything else you do with that kind of perspective that maybe a lot of people probably can't, can't understand at your age. Mm. Um, yeah, for me, it was, it was a mixture of stuff. There was, like, school life, there was out-of-school life, mm. there was home life, and then there was, like, recreational life, like music, sports, whatever it was. Now, school life was very much... I, I, for, the, for all intensive purposes, I, I was academically capable in school. My, most of my predicted grades and my grades, when a lot of them were A's and A stars. It's not necessarily how it ended up in the end, but we, we, we can talk about that. Um, but there were just certain things that, that built me um, for life. And if I'm honest, it was most definitely home life and out of school life. It was ne school life did not build me for the real world. School life doesn't build anyone for the real life. For the real world, sorry. Studying for an exam from year seven to year 11 for five years to, to write something down on a piece of paper and be given a grade is, is complete rubbish. So school life did not prepare me for anything, which is why I'm grateful for the teachers that would go above and beyond and teach you more than just what was on the curriculum, teach you life skills along the way. So I, I think we've all had a, one, at least one teacher like that that was just more than a teacher, yeah, um, which was amazing. But yeah, for me, it was difficult. There was always complications, there was always whatever was going on at home, whether it, whether it was with siblings or whether it was with my mum or, or whatever, there was always something going on um, that, that just kind of, kind of like, to, to do, like, more, more so, like, more so with, like, my mum, for example. My mum's been very ill the majority of her life. And where my older two brothers that I kind of live with or grew up with weren't at home a lot of the time because they were like one of them was working the other one was was living away as well it was majority me that was like there so whether it was like good times or bad times i was not only dealing with the burden of what my mum was going through on a day-to-day -day basis but i was trying to hold it down for me as well as hold it down for her as well as hold it down for us right. which is why it was very much um just had to deal with it like very much just had to yeah, hundred percent. Like the, the, I, I was offered stuff like mentoring and counselling and and all this stuff, but for me it was just like you're trying to counsel me on something that I've just lived with because I didn't have no other option. Like I'm not going to crumble. It was just do it. So I don't need counselling or mentoring on that because I've been doing that myself. So that was like the home life, and then you've got like the the me trying to do music and well, trying to train like five days a week for sport to go and do athletics. But then I found this new love for music creeping in. And then you've got, like, outside influences of, of like, the, the out-of-school life of, of involvement in just, like, dumb stuff 
that just didn't need to, to happen or, or, or just people that you shouldn't have met and should have stayed far away from and stuff like it. it the mixture of it all, as I, I feel like, has built me into a person that will not be beat or defeated in any shape or form, like, at all, whether that's, like, I, there is no quit for me, there is no end. Like, I do not stop working, I do not stop moving forward. Like, the, the, the stuff that I've been through and seen has built me to the point where nothing other than death will stop me, right. literally. And I mean that in, in no... I don't mean that lightly at all. I mean that I will not stop for anything. I do not have that luxury, no. I wanted to ask you, yeah, before we get off this, the, the period of, like, you being super young, would you say that there was a silver lining in the sense of being really occupied with what was going on at home mm. and also what was going on with your passion that ultimately kept you fully away from the streets. Because where you come from mm. and the environment that you... that is essentially just your doorstep, mm -hmm. yeah, is something that you could easily find swallowing you up. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Would you say that you spend a lot of time at home and more on your passion as that being your silver lining that kept you away from that those side of things. Yeah, yeah. It don't get wrong, I was never I never got sucked into the point where there was no escape, there was no way out. Right. But was definitely in there. But there was no you can't escape. It was always for me music or, or, or family life or something was always like the priority, if that makes sense. But it was still very much like in and out, in and out, constantly in and well, not never really out. It was more just trying to do the right thing more than I was doing the wrong thing, if that makes sense. Um, but I definitely feel like that has the silver lining is I think it built me up to to clock certain things in advance now, certain situations. It's it's definitely made me more resilient, like a hundred percent. Um and and even down to stuff like it it, 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 it's just, I just feel like it's built my, I feel like my environment has definitely shaped me a lot to, to the person of who I am and I don't regret any of it. I regret nothing in life that's ever come my way because I, I can't regret something because without it, I don't know who it, I would necessarily be as a person. Um, and my, 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 my older brothers were there as well. Um, they they very much tried to to keep me in line as much as as they could and just yeah mm -hmm. was always yeah. What I also found really interesting, yeah, what you mentioned was talking about being in school, yeah, being the fastest person in school, <laughs> and then when you come out of school now into the big wide world, now you realise that maybe that you true. ain't really that quick. <laughs> You're quick still, but you're not really that quick, and I think that speaks to. Um, comparison and how we compare ourselves sometimes which can ultimately drive us crazy how do you stop yourself from doing that as an artist because naturally that must be something that you do outside where you're like okay cool you know what i've done this and i've achieved this and it yeah. feels amazing and then you look out into the world and you see this person achieving that yeah. or doing this. Especially now in a time where numbers are just everywhere as well. Right. So it's like the comparison is just thrown in your face even more than it has been ever before. Yeah. Um, I don't, I do, I do compare myself a lot. I'm going to be honest, I'd be lying if I said I didn't. But what I use the comparison to do is to spur me on and say, OK, well, how do I get to that point? Like, how do I do this? Blah, 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 right, right, right. Um, and, and, like, from, from the age of 17, in bare publications, a, a, a lot of it, especially BBC as well, tries to tip me as the next Stormzy. So when you get hit with that from such a young age, it's like, damn, like, this is Big Mike. Like, do you know what Big Mike's out there doing? Like, I, I don't know how I do that, blah, blah, blah. So, but I don't, I don't look at it as a burden. Same way the whole Prince of Grimes, I don't look at it as a burden. I look at it as something to... to endeavour to work towards in to show that I'm I'm deserving of it and, and I use it to spur me on to be like I don't want to make these comparisons but as it stands the comparisons are being made and I need to make them for myself because I need to know something to work towards like if this is what this person's doing and has done then that's great that works for them it might not work for me so 
how do I get to the position where, okay, I might not do exactly the same things as them, but I'm at a position where, which is similar to theirs or, or better than that. You always, anytime you compare yourself to someone, you always want to do better than them. And I think part of that is always going to be a slightly a bit of jealousy and a bit of envy. But as long as it's not in a malicious way, it's in a self-improvement, self-betterment kind of way, then there's nothing wrong with that. Competition and healthy competition is beneficial to everyone. Like, that's how the world works. So for me, it's, it's just always been... I compare myself to someone. I don't let myself get caught up in the idea of that, though, because the time it takes me to compare myself to my man, my man's working. He's not comparing himself to me. And in that time, I've just wasted what? Thinking about someone else. I will not waste my time thinking about someone else or something that is not helpful, healthy, or beneficial to my life because no one is going to live my life other than me, and I can't get back time. Like... I saw this quote online where it's like, what do, what do you give the person in the world that has everything? What's the one thing that they wish they have but can't get more of? It's always time. You will never get back time. You can get money. You can get materialistic stuff. You can get whatever you want. You cannot get back time. Same way you can't get back a loved one. Same thing. So for me, I'm not wasting time on the comparison. I am acting on the comparison to better myself mm. to get to a position where that's not the case anymore. So obviously you got into... The, the scene started taking it as a, as a career, as a profession, mm -hmm. at a time when there were a lot of figures coming out of grime that were definitely giving you inspiration to take it further and, uh, you know, people were, were going around the world and taking grime to places they hadn't been. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as the, the, the self-titled Prince of Grime, like, how important to it, how important to you is it to continue to try and push, you know, forward the barriers of, of, of grime music? Uh, most definitely. I feel like, especially in a time where grime music isn't the most popular sound in the UK, in certain other countries, the demographic for it and the way they love it is they love it more than we do because it's less accessible there. Like, if you, if I, there's a, I went to Ukraine, and to this day, that's still, or we went to Ukraine. And to this day, that is still the best show I've ever done in my life. The, the reception I got from that crowd was more than I've ever got from a UK crowd. And when I try to break down why, it's because, not being funny, you can walk into Skepta in Shoreditch. You, you, you can't do that in Ukraine. I find that with London crowds. That's why <laughs> when you're on tour, the London show is always the tour where they're like just standing up. Yeah. I've uh -huh. just paid to watch you. Yeah. Like this, no perform for me. But if you go up north, Manny, yeah. Leeds, Sheffield, Newcastle, they go blind it for it. Like there's a, like the, the appreciation level is super different. It's that separation, yeah, I think, right. that slight separation where you're not on the doorstep. Like you said, you can't bump into a man coming out of the chicken shop at no. 3 a.m. in the morning <laughs> or whatever, or see him shopping in Selfridges and all that stuff. I mean, right. it's like this guy that I've only seen on YouTube. Yeah, and I, and I feel like it, it's... Always the out of London shows that seem to be more energetic, mm. um, and I don't think that's necessarily a, a, a terrible thing. Because at the end of the day, like if it's if it's what you're exposed to on a regular, then you become um, normalised to it. Mm. So you don't see it in the same way that someone who's only ever seen it via YouTube or whatnot has seen it. Which is I understand that completely, but it's it's a case of that's great. And doing shows abroad and where not is great, and pushing grime worldwide is great, but you do need a place for it to start from. Like, starting it from... You need a solid fan base from home. Like, you need to make sure you're good at home before you start trying to look elsewhere. Or bef even before you start trying to help others, you need to make sure you've got your stuff together. Um, but for me, building internationally has always been something that's been top of my list and a, and a priority. Because um, it's like, in a time where grime music gets appreciated um, in certain countries more than it does in the UK, it's like, I'm not being funny. If this is the kind of music I do, I'm going to go where I'm appreciated. Like, mm. it, it makes sense, no? Them streams all pay the same, don't matter where <laughs> they come from, you know what I mean? Them numbers... <laughs> Legit. Um, and like I said, I love performing abroad as well, and I love connecting with people, like, whether, whatever countries it is, I love travelling. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's, it's very important to, to continue to push the sound uh, worldwide, especially in the sound that's just quite junior compared to a lot of sounds. I mean, it's been around for about what, like, 20 years, give or take, compared to a lot of the other sounds. Conversely, though, it's like, this is something I wanted to ask you, actually. So, you know, at the moment, the sounds that are, you know, the black British music sounds at the forefront, you're looking at drill, as you said, the Afro swing, Afro bashment style. Um, 
you know, Grimes old compared to that. <laughs> uh, Realistically, do you know what I mean? And, and you talk to a lot of kids, you know, teenagers, mm. like for them, grime is like some old people's music. Mm. So how do you keep like a fresh approach to something that's been around for decades, but you're a fresh artist, yeah. like people in your peer group maybe not be checking for it as much as you do. Mm. Like how do you balance that out in your head and the creative process, because that's really interesting to me. Like, I'm an old man, I've been around Graham for half my life, you know what I mean? Yeah. But to hear it from, you know, someone who's going out there and trying to continually keep it fresh, I well, think would be fascinating. Say, people always love what's new. People love what's new. Like, whatever's old is like, it's all right, but it's not exciting, it's not fresh. So for me, it was always about, I want to do Graham in a way that's new, that's unique. I don't want to do Graham how they did it 20 years ago, because they've done it 20 years ago for a reason, in a certain way. I mean, certain stuff weren't as accessible, doors weren't open, stuff was shunned, raves were locked down. There's a reason for the type of grime that was going on back then. Same way for all the great things that's going on in life right now, social media, accessibility to certain platforms. It's a different kind of grime music now. And I wanted to give the my interpretation as, as a 16, 17, 18, 20 or whatever uh, of grime because I feel like my perspective was unique compared to what had come before me. Like, I'm telling my story as, as someone of my age mm. for what Graham is. Um, so, and, and people always love seeing something they've not seen before. So for me, as I wanted to do Graham in a way it's not necessarily done, been done before. So a couple ways that, that I endeavoured to do that was there's not been a lot of collaborations between, and this is another thing, the people at the top and the up-and-coming people, the gap is ridiculously wide. Mm. There's not been a lot of collaborations with that. So I've tried to come through as many collabs um, when it's been... Where, where come through with collabs in moments where it would matter and get the most attention. Like, there was the Me and Dizzy collab. Recently, there was the Me and JME collab. There's the, the Me and Devlin collab. There's however many collab, producer collabs. Like, it's all about building the connection between the people at the top and the up-and-coming people. For me, I think that's integral um, in... in um, pushing the sound forward and, and kind of keeping it fresh, but also still looking out for the people that, that love the nostalgia. Yeah. Um, and it's about doing grime in a unique way. Like, for example, if, if someone heard their favourite drill artist on a grime rhythm, they'd absolutely love it because it's something new to them, when really it's just a grime beat. It's just who you like doing something different. Likewise, it's like if I do grime or someone does grime on a drill beat, grime flows, for example, people like that because they've not seen that as much. It's... There's a reason why DWE can walk into a rave and go, ooh, and get the maddest reaction you've probably ever seen from a show in your life. DWE is one of the most unique MCs ever. If you look at every single person that has excelled in the, in the field of grime in their own way, they are unique in some way, whether it's the energy of gets, whether it's the combination of one-line flows and massive songs like Skepta, or it's down to someone who, who's just madly unique, like DWE and, and has their own style they've excelled because they've been unique and they've done it in a way that's not been seen before. That is how you engage with a younger, fresh audience or a new audience in general. You give them something that they like in a way they've never seen it before. 100%. And you know what? That is That speaks to something that I've been saying a lot on the platforms that I've been on, yeah? That I feel that the artists that cross over the best are the mm. ones that are giving people something that they've never seen before. Mm -hmm. So even when you were talking about, even when there was the conversation between, you know, artists here and crossing over to America or wherever it may be, I was always like, if you give them what they've already got, it's mm -hmm. not work. Mm -hmm. the, one of the reasons why Skepta did so well over there and has done so well over there is because there isn't one. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? One of the reasons why, you know, JME is loved so much in Australia is because there isn't one. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? But what I wanted you to do is just talk a little bit more about that gap because you did mention that to me a few times about feeling like there was a, a gap between yeah. your generation and, like, and the really first generation. But Definitely a gap. Um, um, for some reason, and I don't know, obviously I'm in a very unique position, pos position with a unique perspective because I've been blessed to have worked with a lot of these people at the top. But I'm talking from the average person looking in and the average up-and-coming MC. The gap from the people at the top of the grime field in terms of success and ability compared to the up-and-coming people, vice versa, in terms of ability and success is massive. And I don't know what that is. And from the outside looking in, it looks like the people at the top 
don't check for the up and comers a lot, and I don't understand why. I, 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 it doesn't make sense to me, um, and it, it just feels, especially when you're one of these up and coming or these young artists, 16, 17, it just feels like we're working in a field where the people at the top don't give a shit about us. So let me ask you: when you've reached out and approached um, these artists to, to collab yeah. work. You know, how aware of your work were they when you, you tried to start making that connection? Mm -hmm. Now, this is the maddest thing, which is why my perspective is quite unique. Every single person that I've linked up with, big artists, major artists in grime, every time I've gone to, or, or I've met someone for the first time, I said, I'm blah, 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 I do grime, blah, blah, blah. They've said, yeah, I know who you are. Now, that was weird for me, because it's like, I've never spoke to you You've never openly big me up. We've never engaged. This is just me telling you I'm a fan, blah, blah, blah. And this is who I am. I do this music. So for me, that was always weird because it's like, obviously, you, you might know who I am, but I'm like, how do you know who I am? Like, what, 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 how has this come about? Or if you know who I am, why is this is the first time we're conversating? Like, why don't we, like, why is nothing, why is it taken till now for me to, see you and say I'm a fan and kind of look up to you in a certain way to get that reaction. Why, why do we not see you at sets? Why do we not see you doing a tweet? I mean, a tweet is free. There's what, you're telling me dot, dot, so and so at the top can't I tweet you. I definitely see tweets going out from artists at the top co-signing stuff from outside of the scene oh, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And, um, it's this, and it's usually, and even the artists that co-sign stuff that's in the scene, it's the same artists that have always been clean-hearted and just done that from day to one. But it's like, and I think I've worked out what it is. When you're an artist at the top, like everyone's a sort of a certain age and, and over the years you have a certain level of relevancy before you eventually just aren't what you were at your prime. And the way I see it, the people at the top have one of two options. They either embrace what's coming or they try and show some resistance against it. Like, whether you want to embrace the fact that you're not going to be around forever and there's someone younger that's going to come and do what you've been doing and use you as a blueprint to do well, or you look at it as like, now you know what? I don't really want to look at them young, I just want to do me, I just want to do me, blah, blah, blah. I'm not, I'm not going to pay attention to them, I'm just going to do me. If they, no, I don't really care about them. You either accept or you reject. It's like in, in every sport or, or competitive industry ever, football, whatever, there's always a young... When Cristiano Ronaldo retires, for, for Portugal when he's not the striker anymore, there's Jean Felix. There's always going to be someone younger ready to go. You either accept that and move with the times and you try and show love and you benefit and you be the person that is, that is a, a pillar of their career by being that support kind of person for them musically, whatever. Or you be the person that just tries to, not necessarily shun, but pretend as if they're not there. This is happening. You are not going to be around forever. Build your legacy, leave behind something that is amazing, and leave behind something and interact with the next people to come. Like, there are so... Like, like where, where it happens in, a, in other fields a lot. There are always people at the top of rap games that always look for the next young person worldwide, in fact. But it seems like grime is the one genre in the world where the people at the top are afraid to, to openly show support or love towards the younger people to come through. And I don't understand why. And even the people that are showing love, it's the same people. Well, let me, let me ask you a question then, because um, this will tie into what you're doing now. Um, if you look at the establishment of rap and hip-hop in America, once you reach a certain point in America, the industry is set up in such a way that, you know, it's financially beneficial for you as an artist slash creative slash tastemaker to start bringing through more artists because... You can actually earn off that. You're, sure. you're, you're optimizing your revenue by having artists with you, underneath you, on your label, what have you. We don't really have that infrastructure here no. where you're looking at guys at the top and they're signing and bringing through a lot of young people. Now, you can look maybe look back to Wiley at the start and how he helped bring through people, but it was never like a, yeah, boom, you're going to sign to me, right. yeah, and yeah. boom, and right. thing, and, you know... Um, because I don't think Wiley ever really operated in that way of I want to try and make money I out of you. I don't think he wanted to. No, exactly. I, I, just, I just don't to... think he has that in his heart. Yeah, exactly. I feel like he probably just didn't want to make money per se yeah. from someone. Like Rather that. than just see them succeed and grow. Right. But, you know, and it's an awkward balance because you don't want to get into that kind of exploitative realm. It, it but it's question. important, though, to, to have that platform that 
artists that know what's supposed to happen, mm -hmm. you know, that understand the industry, the in and outs, yeah. okay. can help the next generation uh, from the community and the culture, mm -hmm. can help the next generation navigate that labyrinth. Because as someone that's been in the grime scene from the start, the big hindrance in mm -hmm. the beginning was we were basically cast adrift by the, the garage scene to do our own thing, right? Yeah. And it was like we were the abandoned kids. Like, the garage dads, like, left and never come back from going to the shop. And we're just here trying to grow up as young men, don't know the business, don't know the industry, mm. don't really know how things work. All right, cool. The guys at the top now, you know how the industry works. Yeah. Um, is that something you want to do with your label? Oh, 100%. I, I'm, I'm already in the process of doing stuff like that. I, I, I provide... Because you're not an old man, by any means, but there's definitely, <laughs> there's definitely youngers coming through that are younger than you still, yeah. you know? But it, for me, it could even be something random. Like, I get, I get a DM off someone and they might ask about how, how do I go about doing this, or I jump on live with someone and I try to give them advice, or, or I try and let the... I try and explain my br blueprint or, or give important advice in the shape of like interviews for example but I, that's something i want to do and, and i'm in the process of doing already with with the label and and stuff that i'm setting up um and i feel like it's very important and for me it's never been just about me thinking well why are the people at the top not doing it? it's just like well you know what see all of you look one you look because i'm gonna do it yeah like you don't want to do it all right i'm annoyed that you ain't doing it we're all annoyed you're not doing it but you know what? we're not gonna sit here and cry someone's going to do it. Right. Be the change no. you want to see in it. 100%. And I'm just like, if I've got a label and I know how infrastructure works and I know how to do certain things and I just know people that are really talented, then yeah, you know what? We're going to come and work. And most of the time, in fact, no, all the time, it's not even about a money thing. I don't care about money. I, I like the idea of passing on information and knowledge so that someone can better themselves. Yeah. Like, like, information is free nowadays. It's like people are scared to show help in the grime scene. Every other sound in the entire world, people love each other, they help each other, they're all friends. Grime, no, for some reason. I don't know about that, but... <laughs> all right, no, sorry, not all friends, but it's like... Grime is, the, is the, the one genre in the world where we are reluctant to openly show... Yeah. And, 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 and praise people for I their achievements I just feel like stuff. people are reluctant to work together and succeed together, you I know don't what know I mean? Why. Like, it grows everything. But the, the thing that ticks me off the most is, and I, and I still don't have an answer, and I'd love to see someone provide an answer, these people at the top of their field in grime, you have the financial ability, you have the intelligence, you have the knowledge, and you have the time. And the network as well. And the network. Which is... You have everything that's needed to start a, a label or some kind of infrastructure, even if you all came together to do it and push your own platform. Why is there no Grime equivalent... Sorry, why is there no equivalent of a link-up TV for Grime, for example? Why is there no Grime label? We've got labels that specialise in dubstep and electronic music. What, why is there no Grime label? You're telling me that out of all the people that... Are, sorry, why is there no Grime label on the same level as, as some of these majors or extremely successful independent right. labels? Why are they not being given the resources and time yeah. and effort to do that? Yeah, yeah. You're telling me that the people at the top, what? You can't jump on a phone call with my man and say, you know what? Can we do something? What's going on with that? You're telling me what? You don't have the money? Lies. You're telling me you don't have the time? Brother, we've been in lockdown the whole time. How many years has it been? You're telling me in all the years of going on, you have not sit down to think of an idea? Time. So that's a lie. Network. You are getting your songs regularly played here and there and promoted here and there. So you do have a network. So that's a lie. Intelligence. You think that a lot of these people don't have teams around them or don't have the, the, the self-capability in order to come up with ideas, to put out these records and ideas. About. So that's a lie. So then what does it come down to? You have the financial, you have the time, you have the intelligence, you have the network. What are you doing? You either genuinely don't care, which is amazingly horrible to see the fact of a, of a sound that so many people love and cherish and you once loved and cherished in a way, or still do, but you're not willing to do that for the people that are there to come afterwards. But in every other sound, there is plenty of labels. That's nothing to do with the labels, the grand labels. That's nothing against the grand labels that are trying to do that. But they are not, at their current rate, going to be able to rival or do what these big labels are doing without help. So what is stopping the people at the top from helping? Well, this is the thing. I think, like, you know, we all know that there's strength in numbers. You know what I'm saying? And if people came together, like, especially some of these guys, it would be powerful some of the things that could happen but you know what as logan said it's about 
you know, being the change you want to see. Mm-hmm. And you have your label, mm-hmm. RTL. Talk to me about yeah. the, the name, the label. And... Um, so RTL is the label. So previously to this, the label had set up with Living Legends. So when you go back and look at everything that's ever been released, most of the time you'll see Living Legends, or you'll see Living Legends licensed, the blah, 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 for example. But the, the, the establishing point for me as an artist was my manager going at 16, you should set up your own label. And also, some of my close friends at the time that had labels uh, as well going, um, you should set up a label. And I, was, and I never understood it, never really saw the point. And then the more I researched and looked into it, I was like, you know what, this is beneficial. And I can't remember who it was, but someone said to me that if everything was to crumble and fall apart tomorrow, there's no channels to release on, there's no label, there's no nothing, no one can take away your label from you, go and start a label. Um, so that was another thing that spurred me on. When I've got to the stage in my career now where I feel like not only as I'm, I'm, am I more matured as an adult, but I'm more knowledgeable, the previous label that I had set up, the philosophies around that as a 16-year-old kid is different to the philosophies I'm at now at the age of 20. So I wanted a label to reflect that, that would move forward and be a, a, a symbol that people could get behind. So RTL stands for Remember to Live, and the, the, the significance behind that is we live in a world where people have got family stuff going on, they've got financial struggles, they've got whatever going on. A lot of the time, people forget to just actually live their life because they're caught up living a narrative that someone's thrust upon them or they're caught up living a life that they think is cool or trendy. Some people just forget to, you know what, you've got a limited amount of time on this earth. Do you live? So for me, it's like a refresher that you've got to remember to just do you and live your life. And I feel like that's something that people can definitely get behind and anyone can relate to, whether it's a three-year-old kid, an eight-year-old man, 25-year-old, whatever. You've got to remember that you've got one life and you've got to live it. Um, so what I wanted to do with that is I wanted to set up a, a label that could sign people, could put out my own music, could stand as... I always said I wanted to create a label that, that could rival uh, or become a UK equivalent of, of something like, I don't know, Aftermath or, or Death Row or any of these big labels in America that once started from just someone with an idea in their bedroom. I wanted the UK equivalent of that. Because when I was looking at some of the biggest independent labels that I have for people that release music similar to myself, I think the biggest label that I know of that does that would be Disturbing London. Now, if you look at someone like Disturbing London and what Tiny's been doing with that and and all the people around him compared to what the biggest independent or originally independent label over in America is, the gap is miles apart. So for me, it's about how do we get that gap smaller to the point where we have labels, independent labels, that rival that of majors and our, our own thing compared to what's going on in other countries around the world. Now, I believe that that's completely possible. We live in a day and age where social media rules everything. You can definitely do that. It just takes time, resources, network, whatever. But you start how you mean to finish. A lot of these people, when they're doing these labels or Aftermath or whatever it was in America or UK or Disturbing London, they're not doing it at the ages of 18, 19, 20. They were probably doing it at ages of about 23, 24, 25. They got signed, they got some money. Now it's like, okay, after the deal, I need something that's myself. I want to build something now. No, that was never the case for me. From 16, label, everything through the label, always had to push myself, build my own brand. From doing that at 16, I know that I will be able to reap the benefits of of time, that when I get to the 25s and 26s, when a lot of these people were starting these labels, I already have the years of experience and mistakes to learn from and to go through in order to be that massive independent that can provide platforms where certain people at the top have been reluctant to provide them and certain people in general have been reluctant to provide them for whatever their own reasons at their own discretion. I, like Logan said, want to be that change. I'm not just going to moan about the fact there hasn't been that opportunity because I've been blessed to receive certain opportunities. But I've also passed people in my career that have not been as blessed as me. And it's annoying to see talent go to waste and stuff like that, especially when people are coming from similar backgrounds like myself and other hardships. Everyone deserves a chance to to shine in life. All you get is a chance. If you blow it, that's on you. But you deserve that chance and that opportunity. I want to provide that on on a global scale. Like, I believe help starts at home, and then once you've got that secured, sky's the limit. 